All right, I'm over here at Thomason Avenue, which is the first commercial property that I ever bought back in 2021. Maybe just like you, I was a big single family guy. I was dancing around the Bigger Pockets forums, trying to figure out how I can have this financial freedom idea where you have more passive income than you do monthly expenses. That way you can spend your time drinking Mai Tais on the beach. I discovered that single families were not the way to go. I mean, you're talking about maybe making 200 bucks a month of passive income per house, and it's a lot of work to get a deal across the finish line because you've got Section 8 tenants, people that look at you as the greedy landlord, you're the bad guy from Monopoly. So in 2021, after I read the book Commercial Real Estate Investing by Dolph De Roos, if you haven't read it, you need to check it out. It not only changed, my, I say my life, but I definitely had a way different opinion on real estate. Before I knew that I wanted to be a real estate investor, but after I read that book, it changed my perspective on thinking much larger than what I was as a single family guy. So this property right here, 921 Thomason Avenue, my tenant is Estate Products. They are a business based out of Louisville, Kentucky. They go all the way up and down 65, all the way down to Mobile, and they are a steel fabrication business. When I first got this deal, I'll tell you the story, of, we'll walk around. Um, this is a 67,000 square foot warehouse. I own this building, I own that building, and I own that lot that's over there too. But when I first bought this property, it was introduced to me by another investor friend of mine. He brought this deal to me. Again, at the time I had, gosh, 38 houses or whatever I was doing. I had a bunch of property that I was trying to buy up in Indiana, still doing the single family thing. But like I said, I knew that I wanted to get into commercial because of all those attributes that I discovered from the book, Commercial Real Estate Investing. And so this investor friend of mine brought this deal to me and Again, I'll be very candid. I was, I was afraid, I was scared because I did not know much about it. This is a, I bought this building for $1.35 million. Maybe like you, I, I grew up in a Dave Ramsey home where we had envelopes that had like Friday night pizza and our mortgage and electrical bills and all the things that, if, you, if you're a Dave Ramsey, you understand that. And so before when I bought my first single family house, I borrowed $32,000 from Community First Bank in Kokomo, Indiana. My parents told me that I was crazy. And when I went and bought this building, it was a million dollar property or $1.35 million. And I had to borrow a million dollars. So my parents thought I was totally crazy. Now you can see we're on the inside of one of our properties. Again, this is like 67,000 square feet. And like I was mentioning it outside before it started to rain, I bought this building for $1.35 million. It was the first time that I had borrowed a million dollars from a bank. So let me explain to you how I actually got this deal across the finish line from start to finish. I bought this building from, again, another investor in town. It was brought to me by a third party. I call him a, a wholesaler at the time. And again, remember, I was afraid. I, I, um, I was timid because you know, it was a seven-figure deal that I really didn't know what I was doing. And so, but, I, but because I read that book and I was like, I, I know that I have to do this. I have to figure out a way. The biggest problem was, again, coming up with $1.35 million. Who, it's hard to find that. So I was calling my local bankers up in Indiana, Community First Bank. Actually, the, the loan officer drove all the way down to look at the building. He thought there was gonna be like a phase one issue, which is an environmental study, figuring out there's something in the soil that might mess up um, their lending ability, figuring out how we can make this bankable. Um, my bank in Indiana said it's a little bit too far away from us. So I didn't have any banking relationships at the time. I didn't know what I was gonna do. So piece of advice when you're trying to buy your first property, if you're looking at a building like this or wherever you are, consider looking at who is currently holding the mortgage at the time, because that's what I did. So in this case, it was Renaissance Bank was, had the mortgage on this building. So I didn't, even, I didn't even know who the person was at the time. I just called Renaissance and I said, hey, um, I'm thinking about buying this property over here and I see that you guys are the one holding the mortgage. Would you be interested in continuing to hold the mortgage? Because again, remember, my other bank said there might be a phase one issue, which means they were not familiar with the asset. Renaissance Bank had already lent money on this deal, so they became they were already familiar with the deal. So I got introduced to my guy Patrick Levette, and Patrick calls me, he's my age, says, Hey man, I'm you know, I already lent money on this deal like four years ago, five years ago. We'd love to continue holding this because we love the tenant. It's a very stable tenant. He's been here since 2006, and we love the location, Tarrant, Alabama. It's northeast Birmingham. It's right off of the highway, right off I-20. And so when he, we sat down together, again, we've become actually really good friends at this point, like going to dinner with our families. 
And Patrick says, hey man, we really like this asset. We would love to continue to hold this, this deal, this debt. Um, I like to send you a term sheet. Because remember guys, the key with banks is you are not asking them for a mortgage. You are offering them an opportunity to give you a mortgage and you exchange that for the collateral, which is the building that you own, right? So the banks are not these high and mighty guys sitting up in their leather chairs. They work for you. And when you offer them a great opportunity like this building, for example, and this tenant, a very stable tenant, that creates a very low risk profile in the bank size because that's the whole key here is creating consistent, predictable mortgage payments for your banker. That way the deal can become bankable because if you give them what they, what you, what they want, you're gonna get what you want, which is their money. So again, like I said, in this case, um, Patrick and I sat down, he shot me a term sheet. He said, we'd lend you a million dollars on this deal, a million bucks. Again, I was a Dave Ramsey. That was like an extra zero that I had never really seen. It was, it expanded my horizon of how to think big, how to think differently. And so uh, Patrick and I sat back down. He said, we'll lend you the money. So I had to figure out how I was gonna come up with 350 grand. Maybe like you, I didn't have $350,000 sitting around. So what happened was, is the seller at the time, he presented something to me. He's like, hey, Nolan, I would like to leave in this deal $350,000. Because he figured, and we talked about, you know, we became kind of buddies. I bought another building from him since. And we've become friends. But he's like, Nolan, I'd like to leave uh, $350,000 in this deal. And I said, okay, his name is Steven. I said, okay, Steven. I called my account and I said, hey, uh, my account's name is Clay. I said, Clay, why is Steven trying to do this? I thought he was trying to pull a fast one on me. And Clay's like, no, 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 he's, he's just doing it for a tax move. He's trying to separate his capital gains into two separate years by leaving money in the deal, meaning he's gonna finance me the down payment. He'll take a second position mortgage behind the bank. Renaissance Bank will have the first position mortgage and the seller, Steven, would leave $350,000 in the deal as a second position. So I asked Clay, I said, so wait a minute, I can basically just show up on this deal, buy this $1.35 million building with $10,000 of earnest money. Is that what you're telling me? He's like, that's exactly how it is. You can look at the HUD statement. So it was almost like this epiphany went off my mind. I was like, wait a minute. So hang on. So in the seller's eyes, he can save himself whatever the amount of capital gains tax he was going to have to pay on that $350,000. And when I pay him a balloon payment, I'll get to that in a minute, pay him a balloon payment in the future, he'll be in a different tax year. So he'll pay a lower capital gains tax I was like, can that work for anybody? And he's like, if you can preach this from the mountaintops, that can become your gospel. And so that's how I bought 12 buildings since. But on this deal, I essentially bought this property, a million dollar mortgage from Renaissance Bank, a $350,000 second position mortgage from the seller, Steven. And I was able to buy this property that rents out, and I'll get a little bit further here. At the time, it was rented out for $13,100 a month. And that's a gross lease. And very simply, a gross lease is the tenant pays one number and you pay all the expenses out of it and whatever's left over is your net operating income. Very similar to like a real estate or a, a residential property. One night I had, a, I had a kid a couple of years ago that my kid's three months old at the time. I'm literally up in the middle of the night watching a West Coast baseball game, reading through a lease because I had nothing else to do. I was literally reading through this lease because again, remember these guys showed up in 2006. I... Uh, I didn't have anything else to do. I was literally watching a baseball game. I was reading through this lease and I discovered, this is why it's so important. I tell everybody the same thing, especially if you look at our acquisition blueprint, make sure that you read through the lease. Do never, never, I will die on this hill, never hire out a consultant or have an attorney read through that lease. You need to personally read through that lease because you're gonna become way more acclimated with the vocabulary and the language that's in that. You're gonna understand your responsibilities. You're gonna understand the tenant's responsibilities. You're gonna become so much more of a sophisticated investor when you read through the lease yourself versus um, having somebody else do it that might skip over because they're working based upon an hourly wage. I, I say that all because I was reading through this lease one night and I noticed that the tenant was responsible. This is where I discovered a triple net lease. I had no idea what that was. I discovered that the tenant was actually responsible for paying the taxes and the insurance or at least reimbursing me. And I, so I sent this lease to my tenant like the very next day, him and I have, have also become buddies since. I said, Steve, by the way, you owe me this. I was like, this is in our lease. You agreed to this like in 2006. You just simply haven't reimbursed me for it. I go, I'm not asking for, because at that point it had been like 14 months since I'd owned the building. 
And I said, Stephen, you owe me this amount of money. I go, I'm not going to ask you for that, but moving forward, I want, according to our lease, reimbursement for taxes and insurance. He's already been tanning the building. He's already you know, mowing the grass and stuff. But what that did immediately, because think about it, my taxes and insurance on this building, because it's so large, my insurance on this building was like $2,000 a month, right? Or maybe a little bit less, like fourteen or 1600 bucks. The taxes on this thing is like $19,000 a year. So think about it, out of that $13,100, I was paying an extra roughly $3,000 a month on top of my $6,500 mortgage that I owed to my, to my bank renaissance. So immediately that added an extra $24,000 to my income. On top of it, when I bought the building, the tenant uh, only had nine months left on the lease. I extended him another five years. I, I increased the rent $800 per month. And so now, and on top of it, I'll be going to show you in a second, I have a lot back here that I also rented out. I just try to extract more juice out of it. I rent this other build, or this lot over here to a trucking company for 1500 bucks a month. So I went, when I bought the building, and I'll explain how I ballooned my seller out in a second, I went from having $13,100 of income, of gross income, to now having $19,000. $145 a month of gross income and I pay my expenses out of that. So I went from having a net operating income on this building of like 3,200 bucks to now this building has a net operating income of like 8,400 bucks. Just because I read through the lease one night and I extracted more juice out of the lot behind it. So remember, like I said a second ago, my seller left money in the deal. I wanna talk about this, how important this is and why commercial real estate is different than residential. Remember, residential real estate, when you go and buy a property, let's say there's 10 houses in a cul-de-sac, the 11, let's say they're all going for 200,000 bucks, that 11th house is going to be valued at most likely the same $200,000 because residential real estate is valued based upon the market or the comparable sales in the area. Commercial real estate, on the other hand, this is why I love it so much, is because it's based upon the net operating income. So if you can increase the net operating income, you increase the value, it's very simple. So like I said, I bought this building at a gross revenue, 100 and whatever the number is a year, but at $13,100 a month, I increased that number to $19,145 a month. So I increased the income on the building, meaning I increased the value of the building. So what I did, because I negotiated this with the seller, I said, hey, you leave this money, well, he's the one that kind of brought the idea up, and this is kind of how I discovered this whole strategy. But he's like, hey, I'm gonna leave this 350 in the deal. I'd like a, a balloon payment. I'd like to pay that money off in 36 months. So I knew that I had 36 months to increase the value of this building to be able to refinance, borrow more money. Again, I'm borrowing a million dollars right now. If I can go borrow another 350 from the same bank, I can take that extra debt, that 350,000. I actually borrowed 400,000. I take that extra 350,000, I pay off my seller who no longer has a lien on the building, the one bank now has an, the entire lien on the property, and I'm still in the deal for no money. And again, the building's throwing off right now like 8,200 bucks a month of net cash flow. Now, be honest, that's not gonna change your life. It's not gonna be like, oh my God, 8,200 bucks a month. But also, this is one of 12 that I have. Imagine if you've got like 12 buildings that are all throwing off anywhere from four to $8,000 a month of net operating income and cash flow, that can create a lifestyle for you where you can wake up doing things that you want. You don't have to work for somebody else or spend all your time trading it for money. Just by buying a property creatively exactly like this, you can have a chance to create financial freedom. Again, like I said, I'm not like flying on golf streams every day of the week, but I'm up here literally doing what I love every day, which is walking my dog and my kids and my wife, and I get to make my kids breakfast every morning. I, and I will die on that hill that that's the most important thing to me. And you have the same opportunity just by looking and assembling your team with great brokers, great bankers, and finding good opportunities just like this with a great tenant who has another seven years left on this lease. Imagine your residential tenant asking him to sign a seven-year lease on your, on your single-family $35,000 house. It's never going to happen, ever. But this guy, and I'll go one step further, why this is so important to this tenant staying in this space is because this is, he has good will with his customers. So they have 18 wheelers that you can see outside. They have 18 wheelers coming and going all day. You, you see all of this fabricated steel in here. They have 18 wheelers coming and going all of the time. And what happened to this dude? They, they need every single ounce of this space. Every single 67,000 or 
67,000 square feet of this building is necessary for them to run their business. And so if they happen to go, they need to go find a new location, good luck. And also not to mention too, they're probably at a point where it's gonna be more expensive. They're gonna have the goodwill I said with their customers, they're not gonna have it because the 18 wheelers come in and say, where, where did you move to? Where are you now? So all of my tenants think in the same way. If I know that my business owners or my customers are coming and going in the same space, they're never gonna wanna leave. So they wedge themselves in this location. And then me as the landlord know that I have consistent, predictable cash flow. And for my bank, it de-risks the deal because they know that I have a great tenant. They know they have a great low risk borrower. And then what do you know, the next time they have an influx of cash from the Fed, they're calling you because they want to lend money to you. Okay, so as you can see guys, we were just inside a second ago and look around. This is a very boring building. I mean, if you look over here, I mean, just look at the paint. I don't, I don't have to paint this building. I don't have to do anything. Again, this guy is a steel fabrication business. There's nothing going on, but this building throws off roughly 8,100 bucks a month of net cash flow. It's nothing to write home about. I get it. It's not a million dollars of income, whatever, but it's throwing off just over $95,000 a year of net cash flow. That's a pretty good salary for a lot of people, really. And this is just one building. You are not that far away. I promise you, you are not as far as you really think that you are. It's very overwhelming. You think, oh my God, a million dollar property. It's not that difficult to do. Look at this space. It's nothing crazy. And I discover this, especially when you negotiate with the seller and you show them that, hey, Again, this guy showed it to me. Now we show it to other sellers how you can save money in taxes. They leave money in the deal. You form a great relationship with a banker, like my guy at Renaissance that still holds the debt. They are thrilled because I pay my mortgage every single month on time. My tenant, my steel fabricator, pays rent every single month on time. He's here for another seven years. So what I'm getting at, guys, is this is not, you don't have to have all these cool, fancy Lamborghinis and nice cars to show off that you've got passive income from buildings like this. So. I created what we call our acquisition blueprint. It's a 50 step, step by step by step that I personally use on every building and property that I buy. If you look at the description of this uh, video, I'll give it to you for free. You can just follow that thing along and you can buy ugly buildings just like this that can throw off almost six figures a year of passive income that you and your family can, again, become financially free and spend your time exactly how you want, just the same way that I am. I'll see you on the next video.